But for that, we thank you right now for those who sold into the offer, God. We ask that, God, that you not just double it, God, but you, Lord, God, triple a hundredfold, God. We know, God, that, God, if we give to you, God, that you will return it unto us, God. So we sow the seed and we thank you, God, and we bless for the increase, God, that are coming to those that gave. We thank you, God, and we love you, and we bless your name. In Jesus' name, say in Jesus' name. Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. We want to recognize our first time visitors in the house of the Lord. We want Martha Pacheco. I was going to say that. I'm for sure. Pacheco. Amen. And she is a guest of Elaine Lloyd. And we would like for you to stand, Martha. We have a, a special gift for you. We want to say thank you for coming out on today and being with us in the house of the Lord. We want to make you feel welcome, that you know that you're loved and you're appreciated. And God appreciates you being in the house today. Amen. We find us five. We can stand to our feet. Amen. And we know how we welcome our first time visitors into the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name. of the Lord. Amen. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So we want liberty in the house. Amen. Of the Lord on today. We also want to recognize our, one of our sisters in the Lord this morning, Sister Patricia. Amen. It is her birthday. Hallelujah. And we want to say happy birthday to Sister Patricia Joy. Amen. Yeah, make sure you make sure you let her know that you love her, that she is 20 years young. Amen. Make her feel appreciated on her birthday. Amen. We want to thank the Lord. And we also want to, I want to uh, say praise the Lord. Amen. To Sister Janine. Glad to see you again, Sister Janine. We miss you. We love you. God got so great for you. We thank God for you. Amen. This morning. Praise the Lord. We are God is good and he's worthy to be praised all the time in the house of the Lord. We thank you. How many of you glad to just be saved? Hallelujah. This hour with all the things that's going on in our world and the big things that are happening that are transpiring in our world. Amen. With all these bombs that are exploding, going off, people that are being stabbed in the malls and all for the name of Allah. We want to <laughs> continue to pray for our nation. Amen. Because our nation is in turmoil. and But we, we as a church, we should be in turmoil. Amen. If the world is in turmoil, the church needs to be in peace. Amen. And recognize that we serve a God that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that we can ask or think. But I just thank God for being saved and being delivered and set free and being able to be a witness in this hour because God is so great uh, and so mighty that he will allow take your life, Brother Todd, and uh, take you off the course, the path that you were on that was leading to 
your demise and your destruction and put you on a path called straight and cause your life to be a witness and a light to those that are in darkness. When people look at you, they will now see Jesus. And that is what we want them to see. We want them to see the spirit of God illuminating through our lives, not because of what we do, because of whom we serve and because of the relationship that we have with him. And so many people are faltering in this hour and in this day because they don't have a relationship with God. I'm not talking about a here and there relationship or every now and then relationship when you want to relationship. But I'm talking about a real genuine relationship that you hear from God and he hears from you and you know the moving of the spirit and you know where he's heading and he lead you by day, by cloud and a pillar of fire, by night he's with you on your right hand and on your left, in your front and in your back and you know he's got you regardless of what you're going through you know that he is there and we have so many people that are faltering in this hour that have been living for the Lord a long time, but we thank God that he has found grace and mercy. Amen. And we thank the Lord for what he's doing, but I want to go expeditiously to the word of the Lord on this morning. I was preparing to preach one thing, and the Lord took me in another direction uh, uh, this morning, and so I have to be obedient to what the Spirit uh, is leading me to say to his people on today and we're going to be coming out of the book of Genesis chapter 13 a, a very familiar passage of scripture uh, in, in, to our hearing uh, when you have it just say amen how many of you love the word of God hallelujah I love the word of God because it is life it is life Amen. The word of God, everything else will pass away, but the word of God will remain. It will remain intact. It will remain true. Amen. And everything that it says, it will do. Amen. And if you haven't just said amen, and, and we will stand and for the reading of the word of the Lord, just a very short two scriptures. And I'm not going to not try not to be before you long. We just want the Lord to move. Amen. And Genesis 13 trusts as Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Father, we thank you this morning. We praise you. We give you glory. And God, we thank you for what your word is going to do in the house. Oh God, we thank you, God, because we know that you are to take these lips of clay. Use them to speak forth your oracle. Take this mind for God. I am your vessel, Lord. You use me as you see fit, Lord God. Father, I thank you, Lord God, this morning. Let your mind be my mind. Your thoughts, my thoughts. Your eyes, my eyes. Let me see in the spirit and hear according to your spirit, Father. Father, we thank you right now that you would break every shackle, loose every chain, set your people yeah. free, Father. That we would go into the yeah. earth, Father, and go into the marketplace, the highways and the highways, and compel men, women, and children to come to see the uh, the the Lord God, the miracle signs and wonders that you are going to accomplish in this hour, Father. Father, we thank you right now and we give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, will the church say in Jesus' name? In Jesus name. Amen. And you may be seated. I'm not going to give uh, amen uh, a title, but uh, we must understand that in this particular passage of scripture, we, we know the familiar story uh, people of God, we we often look at this story and we, we look at it and we, we read it uh, every day and we really don't realize the, the, the uh, capacity or realize the real meaning behind scripture a lot of times until God opens it up to us. But many times we as people of God, we are fighting one of the greatest battles in our, of our life uh, that we will ever fight. And a lot of times we believe that, uh, that the uh, battle we are fighting is the battle against the devil. And a lot of times it's not a battle against the enemy, but it's the battle and, and a battle against sin, but it's a battle against self. It's the battle against your own flesh. The battle that you fight is against yourself. 
the spirit and the flesh are contrary one to another. And our, our fight is with the spirit of self and the spirit of pride uh, that makes us feel strong and independent. And, and pride, we know, is a killer, amen, of, of faith. Pride will tell you you can do what you want to do. Uh, in that what happened, uh, amen, in this particular passage, uh, when you read the whole story, it was really a sense of pride, a, a self thing, a self thing. Someone say a self thing. Uh, uh, pride will tell you, you you don't have to wait on God. You don't have to pray. Uh, you can do it the way you want to do it. Uh, you who, who, who needs someone uh, to tell you how to live and and, and, and how to give and where to go and, and, and how to how to uh, walk and how to talk. Pride will tell you you don't have to read your Bible. You don't need a guideline. You don't need uh, barriers. You don't need uh, a warning signs. Pride will tell you you are talented enough uh, that you don't need the anointing of God to lead you. You don't need the Holy Ghost. Uh, but how do you know that self is a deception? Uh, the heart is a deception. And the Bible says above all it is desperately wicked. Uh, and who can know it? Uh, pride will tell you you can stand on your own. Uh, you're smart enough uh, to make the right choices. Uh, but how do you know that we in ourselves uh, cannot make right choices? Uh, we need the divine intervention of God. Uh, we need God to tell us our right from our left, uh, our front from our back. Uh, come on, Facebook land. We need God to give us direction and instruction. And oftentimes what happens is because we're in self, we make the wrong choices and we decide the wrong things. Oh my God. But, but we know that when we give it to God, God is able to handle it. He's able to do it. First Corinthians 10 and 12 says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand take heed, lest he fall. So God, what Paul was saying is that when you think you got it all together, people, a lot of times you don't understand that your way that seems right to you uh, is a way that leads to destruction. Uh, the strongest believer, the most anointed and effective believer is one who has learned the secret and the necessity and the joy of leaning on Jesus. Uh, Leaning on Jesus, understanding that God will direct your path. When we try to direct our own path, we oftentimes get in trouble. I'm going somewhere. Just bear with me. But my message today is deal and deals with us leaning on the Lord and not leading in the wrong directions of our life in our own self. As believers, we are leading towards something. The only question is, which way are you leading? Uh, are you leading toward God uh, or are you leading toward yourself, uh, your own decisions, your own way, uh, your own thoughts, your own plans? Uh, which way are you leading toward? Uh, are you leading towards God? Are you leading towards the world? Uh, are you Where are you heading today? Uh, are you heading in the plan and the purpose and the design that God has for you? Uh, Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. The word leading means it is an adjective. It's an adjective. Something that describes a, a, a verb. A verb, the, the verb. A verb is a verb, I think. Amen. But the act of deviating from a vertical position. See, when you begin to lead, you begin to what? Deviate from an upright position. You begin to tilt. You begin to be tipped. You begin to depart or be you caused to depart from a true vertical horizontal way, a way of truth. When you lean to yourself, your own understandings, you are leaning the wrong way, the wrong directions. When you convince yourself that you know what's best. 
for you when you believe that you are strong enough to stay saved in this hour, in this day, when you feel like you don't have to pray, come on, somebody. We got to pray in this hour. We got to be saved in this hour. We got to let no God know that we trust him, that we are leaning on you, God, because my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My understanding is not your understanding. Your ways are so much higher and so much excellent than mine, oh God. And I want to lean to where you want me to lead. We have to be saved, but we think that we have it together. And when we begin to lean, we convince ourselves we know what's best. When you believe that you're strong enough, when you believe you are tough enough, when you believe you don't have to pray, when you don't have to read your Bible, when you don't have to come to church, when you don't have to attend uh, events in the church, let me tell you something. What? Once a Sunday and once a Wednesday, Wednesday is not enough, and once a Tuesday is not enough. You've got to be in contact with God every day. Let me tell you something. We live in a time where deception is so great that if you don't know the voice of God, you are going to be deceived. You're going to lead in a way that's going to bring destruction to your life. Everything that's talking, baby, ain't God. You've got to know what is of the Lord. Every prophet that comes is not of God. You've got to know what is of the Lord. My God, not thought he knew what was best for his life. But in the end, he's going to find out it really wasn't what God said. See, that's what happens when you lead to your own understanding. And in this particular passage of text, in the story of Abraham and Lot, we see that Lot represented the flesh, and Abraham represented the spirit. And, and, and the flesh had grown in a great number. It had almost grown as strong as the spirit. And now he was a rival competition against Abraham. See, your flesh, if you feed it long enough, will begin to override the spirit but when you put it under subjection the spirit can live and not be smothered out in other words Lot was the flesh Abraham was the spirit and God said you don't have to separate Abraham from your flesh you don't have to go you know, the way I lead you you don't have to go the way I guide you because the flesh is trying to overcome you in other words Lot was becoming just as strong as the spirit man. The flesh means self. It means your self-life. The flesh wants to always rule. It wants to dominate the spirit man. Come on, somebody. Your flesh don't want you to live in the spirit. It don't want you to walk in the spirit. It wants you to walk above, uh, in your own thoughts, in your own ways, and think you got it together. But you really don't because you are blind and you are foolish. The Bible lets us know. And the blind that leads the blind are going to fall into a ditch. How can you lead someone when you don't even know where you're going? But the spirit is what gives life. It's the spirit. When you start leading the wrong direction, when we begin to allow self to be in charge, it's going to be my way or the highway. My plans, my feelings, what I want, what feel good to me. My God, what makes sense to me. Then you start saying, I don't see anything wrong with where I'm going, what I'm doing, how I'm acting, how I'm talking, how I'm speaking, the people that I'm being around, the conversation that I'm keeping, the things that I'm watching, the people, the things that are, 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 are feel good to me. My God, come on, we're beginning to lead in a way that's not pleasing to God. We're leading to our understanding. And this is just how the church world has become. They're not leading toward God anymore. They're leading toward their self-thoughts. They're leading toward what they want to believe. They're leading toward their theology, their traditions and rudiments of men. They're preaching and they're teaching and they're diverting from the truth of the gospel. And God said you've got to be be saved and born again to inherit the kingdom.
kingdom of God, then you got to be born again of the water and of the spirit. There's no three, four, five, six, seven, eight different ways to be saved, baby. According to the word of God, he said there's only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. It ain't no three or four, five ways you can be baptized, but in the name of Jesus. It ain't no six or seven ways you can be saved, but by the spirit. The inward filling of the Holy Ghost at the day of the book in the book as in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost when he told Peter I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom and Peter said of the God that upon this rock I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it he was talking about the revelation that he gave to Peter of who he was he said I'm God that sits on the throne but I came down to earth I was manifest in the flesh I was justified in the spirit I was seen of angels and now you call me Jesus because when you call on that name there's power in the name the power to walk make your walk right the power to make your talk right the power to make your act right and when you preach your first message Peter on the day of Pentecost you gonna preach repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ he didn't say the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost and the name of Jesus. He said in the name of Jesus. And God, you're going to be you going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. My God. But when we lead to our own understanding, we want to do it our way to try to draw people. But the Bible says if I be lifted up from earth, I will draw all men unto me. God don't need our help. He don't need us to twist his word. He don't need us to think of our theology in our way to be, cause people to be saved. God is the one that wrote the book. He's the one that laid his life down. He knows what it takes for mankind. He created us. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So when we began to lead to our own understanding and do the same things we want to do, then we wonder why you can't stop doing those sinful things, why you can't stop lusting, why you can't stop gossiping, why you can't stop arguing and rebelling, why you can't stop walking in the way that's not pleasing to God. Somebody needs to say, God, give me ways that please you. Give me ways to please you. Let me hide the word in my heart that I might not sin against you, God, that I might have a life that's pleasing to you, God. And then you start saying, I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like coming to Sunday school. I don't feel like coming to prayer. I don't want to pray on the prayer line. Oh my God. Because you're leading to your own understanding. You're leading to what you think is right. But how do you know what you think is right is wrong? At least I'm not going to the club. Then we start trying to justify it. I'm, I, I just want to hang out at the house. I just want to get a little extra sleep. I, I, you know, it ain't important. It, 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 it don't matter. But let me tell you something. Every time the word of God is going forth, we need to be in the presence of the word. We need to be in the presence of God's spirit so that we can grow thereby. How can a young man clean? His ways by the washing of the word. Whenever you have a chance to be in the presence of God, you need to say, I'm going to be there. Spirit of God, lead me. Help me to stop leading to what I think is right. Because how do you know what you think is right going to lead you to hell? Come on. Oh my God. It's going to lead you to hell, Facebook friends. What you think is right. You better open up the black book, that B I B L E, and you better read about it. They stayed in church all night long from 1, 2, and 3 o'clock in the morning, getting fed by the Spirit. We can't even sit in church an hour without falling asleep, without being distracted, without being consumed with other thoughts in our mind. 
die. But then we want to say, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, and full of Holy Ghost walking in power. God say, stop leaving to your own understanding. And then we start trying to justify him. First Corinthians 10 and 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh, thinketh. He said, and let take heed lest he fall. You are leading, you are convincing yourself uh, that you know what's best for you. Uh, you are telling yourself, uh, I don't need anybody. I don't need the preacher telling me what to do. I know how to live my life. Uh, I don't need somebody giving me direction. It's pride, baby. It's pride. Pride is fighting against your faith. Uh, I don't need somebody trying to tell me how to live. I want direction from somebody that's lived longer than me. I want some wisdom from somebody that's had, that has experienced what I haven't experienced. I want direction from somebody that's, that, that understands the reign and the laws of God. I want instruction on how to keep my marriage. I want instruction on how to stay sane. I want instruction on how God can let me walk in blessings and be blessed. If I see somebody living in blessings, I'm not just talking about in, in material things. The church has it so twisted. Come on. They think that when you say bless, you talk about houses and cars. Baby, we got houses and cars, but that don't make you bless. You ain't blessed by the job you have. You're not blessed without my money you got in the bank. You blessed by how spiritual you are. Abraham was blessed because he was spiritual. Lot was not because he was fleshly. We want to be blessed spiritually. We think we think we're leading in our own way. You think, oh well, God, I, I wonder, God, you know, we, we think we got it all together. I wonder if that's what David thought about. I wonder if that's what David thought of. When David got himself in a mess in 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5, when it came the year that the kings were supposed to go to fight, when we're supposed to be engaged in warfare, when we're supposed to be engaged in the spiritual things of God, David was sitting at home, lounging around like many church folks do. They sit up in the house. They don't have to go to church like they don't have to go to church on Sunday. They don't have to go to church on Wednesday. I heard, I read an uh, 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 article the, yesterday here. It was talking about Bill Gates. It said, Bill Gates said, you know what? Sunday is a waste of time to go to church. Because I have other things that's more important that I can do. I said, what a fool Bill Gates is. I don't care how much money Bill Gates has. I don't care how much brick houses, cars, and fame. I don't care how, many, how much Microsoft he has, he has invented. But when it comes to the time that he laid his eyes, he laid down and closed his eyes to die, to go to, to in death. All his money ain't gonna be able to bring them back. All his cars, houses, and his fame, all the Microsoft on uh, PowerPoint and Excel and, and works and all that ain't gonna be able to save Bill Gates. And he's gonna remember those words that he spoke. Of, My God, that Sunday was a wasted day to me, especially if I can be doing something else that's more important. I wonder is that what David thought when he found himself in adultery with another man's wife because he was in a place with God that he should not have been. He was leading to his own understanding. We know the story. Bathsheba got pregnant. David had a husband, Uriah, killed. And it all started with just a little lean, just a little look, just a little going to the wrong, in the wrong way. Just a little thought of, I know what's best for me. I'm doing what feels good to me. Isn't that how we do a lot of time? It's not what God thinks. It's what we think. If it feels good, it must be good. But everything that feels good, that look good, it ain't good. Wow. Oh, hallelujah. Ask somebody that's ever been sick, that's ever been sick, and that food was good, wasn't it? But then all of a sudden you start having adverse side effects from it. Come on, somebody. You say, oh, it was good. I was gobbling it up. I even prayed before I ate. But it looked good. But something that was in the midst of it wasn't good for you. And it caused your body to react to it. That's just how sin is. It looked good. It's tempting. It's a Luring, but it ain't good for you. And it causes adverse effects in your life.
I uh, asked David about it. It all started with a little look, uh, with a little leading uh, to his own understanding. Uh, I don't have to be in battle. I don't fall many battles. Uh, I don't won many victories. Uh, I'm going to leave that to the little, the, the little young pups. Uh, I'm going to stay here in my kingdom uh, and I'm going to rule it from here. Uh, I'm going to just get the, get, the, get, the, get the data sit back and let me know how the battle is going. But I done done my part. Uh, I done spent my time on the battlefield. I killed the lion. I killed the bear. I slew a lion. My God, I done fought in one many victories. It's my time to relax and be laid back. And a lot of times we've been in church for a long time. That's how we feel. We feel it's time for us to rest, relax, and lay back. I've been saved for a long time. I've been doing this. I've been singing on the choir. I've been on the praise team. I've been preaching all the sermons. I've been teaching Sunday school. I've been teaching children's church. I've been driving the Sunday school there. And then we start taking it for and think we have the right uh, to think we know what's best for our lives. Uh, and we start neglecting God. We start going down the wrong way. Uh, we start looking at the wrong thing. Uh, that's what happened to Lot. He started looking at the wrong thing. Uh, he lifted up his eyes, the Bible says, uh, in chapter 13. Uh, and he looked towards Sodom. Uh, he looked at it. Why? Because he was distracted. And then in verse 12, verse 12, is that Lot pitched his tent, leaning towards Sodom. He started leaning. He looked at it. Then he started wanting to go to it. Isn't that how we do when we get complacent in the body of Christ? When we don't do what God tells us to do? When we don't go where God says go? When we don't respond to the Spirit? When he nudges us to pray? We start doing things. We start looking at stuff that starts looking us away, that starts getting us distracted, that starts making us head toward the wrong thing, going down the wrong road, then next thing you know, in chapter 19, you find Lot sitting in the gate, living in the city of Sodom, oh my God, in Psalms 1 and 1, he said, blessed is the man that walketh, not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the sheep of the scornful. You can't be getting your advice from the world. You can't be getting your input from the world. You've got to get it from God. You've got to go to God in prayer. You got to say, God, this is what I need. I need an answer from you. I need your thoughts on this. I need your advice on this. Because, God, I don't have the answers. I don't know what I really need. But, God, I'm asking you because your wisdom is infinite. Your wisdom is past all understanding. And, God, when I think I know what's right, it always leads me wrong. My God, somebody needs to be seeking the Lord. Somebody that hasn't been praying, you need to start praying. Because you will find yourself in a mess. Just like Lot. Lot was a lot of mess. He found himself in a mess because he decided to look and not inquire of God. He Lot was weak in his devotions, but worldly in his desires. A lot of us are weak in the church because we don't pray. We don't have devotion with God. We don't commune with God. So we're weak, and but we're worldly in our desires. We want everything the world got. Oh my God, Aesop said, Lord, my feet well not slipped when I show the prosperity of the wicked. He said, I was looking at how they were blessed. I was looking at how they were look like they were doing so good. And God, I almost slipped and fell out of the righteous path because I was desiring what the wicked had. Lot looked because he was weak in his devotion. Now, how many of you ain't got to raise your hand? But how many of you pray on a dirty basis at least an hour a day? If you can't say yes to that question, then you need to be saying, God, I'm weak in my devotion and I need some strength because God, I don't want to be weak in my prayer, but be worldly in my desire. Because when you don't pray, those worldly and fleshly desires will rise up in you, and you cannot overcome them without the help of God. You got people in the church that's trying to overcome flesh, but they don't pray. Lot couldn't overcome it because he 
he didn't pray. Genesis 13 and 5, I want you to pay attention. I want you to pay attention to this. It said Abraham had an altar. But when it talked about Lot, it said Lot had flocks, herds, and tents. It didn't say nothing about him praying. He didn't have a prayer. But Abraham did. Son, we know Abraham was a man given to prayer. Abraham was a man given his life to God. So when she came in, because he was a man of prayer, he was able to overcome. Lot only had the world all the things in his possession. He had no spiritualness, just like Esau and Jacob. Jacob was a man that desired spiritual things. Esau was a man after what? The flesh. And so we see the result of what happened to Esau and what happened to Jacob. Sodom was known to be a wicked and sinful and very worldly city. A city of sexual promiscuity, a city of homosexuality. But Lot leaned towards Sodom because it reminded him of the land of Egypt, which he had come from. God had saved him from Egypt. God had brought him out, but he chose something that looked familiar to him. Many of us are faulting in God because we're going to things that look familiar, but we're not seeking God. Lot. Lot asked several questions when he looked at the land of Sodom. He said, is this a good place to raise cattle? <laughs> but instead, he should have asked, was it a good place to raise my children? No. Man, he said, a good place to make money. What he should have asked was, was it a good place for me to grow spiritually? Oh God, was it a good place to feed me? He should have been asking, is it a good place for me to be fed by God? Come on, somebody. He was worried about, can he serve himself? Instead of worrying about, was it a place where I can serve God? We look for things that please us, but they don't please God. So Lot found himself in a mess. That's what it means. He pitched his tent leaning towards Sodom, facing Sodom, favoring Sodom, because it was familiar to him. God is trying to shake us up to get out of the familiar, to get into the unknown. Because when you're in the unknown, you're out of control, and God is in control. Because then you can't walk by sight. You've got to walk by faith. That's why God told Abraham, I'm going to take you to a place that you're not not going to know, but I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to give you a seed that's going to number the sands of the sea and the stars in the sky. It's going to be innumerable. Why? Because you're not going to be in a place that's familiar to you. See, God took you out of familiar territory to help bless your life in a greater way. A lot of us don't want to move from the familiar. We want to stay in the familiar, but when you're in the Familiar, you're gonna be lost. You're not gonna grow. You're not gonna be blessed. God has to take you from it to take you to it. Somebody ought to be shouting on that. Because God took us from Missouri, placed us in Tulsa. He thought that we got to walk by faith, people of God. It's not gonna be like it was there. He said, I'm getting ready to give you the sand of the sea. When I look at the congregation today, God said, I'm getting ready to fill it. I want everybody to look around. I want everybody to look around this seat. God's getting ready to do it, church. God said, I'm getting ready to bring back more that the left because they know where truth is. I'm getting ready to bring back those that backslidden. And guess what? I'm gonna have you go reach in and pull them out. Just like I had Abraham pull his nephew out of Sodom. I'm gonna have you reach in and pull them out. God said, I'm getting ready to bring folk from the north, south, the east, and the west. And you're not gonna do it. I'm going to do it. I had to take you out of the familiar. I had to take you from familiar ground. I had to put you in a place that you did not know. You did not choose it, but I chose it. Come on, somebody. But I chose it. That's what he meant. He said he was thinking about Sodom. Lot was not in Sodom. He was not a potato of Sodom sin, but he was close enough. Close enough to look over and see the business of Sodom. Close enough that eventually his spirit became vexed with the filthiness and immorality of that city. Look at your neighbor. 
and tell your neighbor close enough. Close enough. It's too close. It's too close. close. Eventually, I move this whole family into the town. And they are now living in the midst of a city that was given to perversion. God said, See, you didn't understand when you were in Missouri, that place did not want God. That place did not want God. That place did not want me. That's how come your spirit, the spirit could not flow. It was always stunning. You would pour a little, people would come and go. You would see them no more. Why? Because they didn't want the spirit. They wanted to dwell in darkness. God when God went to his own. His own received the God. He had to leave his home and go preach to people he didn't know because they appreciated the gift that was in the Lord. See, we don't sometimes when we understand God moves us out. To help others come in. God moved us out. He moved us out of there. Because others didn't ready to come in. They didn't ready to fill the pews. He eventually not moved his whole family. Into the midst of a city. That was unbridled with sin. But he didn't understand. Now they are no longer learning. Leading on the outside and looking in. Now they are on the inside. They're residents, they're citizens. Oh, do you want to be a citizen of a place that's getting ready to be destroyed? Oh, no. Come on. I'm not a citizen. I'm just a, 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 a pilgrim traveling through. This world is not my home. I got a home that's in glory. That's prepared just for me. It got streets of gold, gates of pearls. My God, where sickness and death cannot touch you. Where you ain't got to cry no more. Where there's no darkness, is always light. Come on, somebody. I can't leave. I cannot afford to leave, Brother Todd, to what I know. I got to say, God, what does the Lord say? What does the Lord think? What is it lead me to do? I, I got to inquire of the Lord. Come on, somebody. When you start leaning toward the world, when you start moving from God, yeah. then eventually you fall into sin. See, Lot began to move away from the Spirit. Division came in. Don't you know the enemy tries to bring division? That's why he tries to bring division in the body. To separate us from the spirit of God. Because where there's confusion, argument, there's every evil one. And he's trying to separate us from the spirit. The spirit of God. So that we can't hear from the Lord. So we don't know which direction we're going in. You start off in your sin. Proverbs 12 and 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can allow the pressure of life to cause you to bend, to tilt, to fall, to let down and begin to pattern your life and your mindset, your attitudes and your appetites after the world. The Bible says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We should not be having fellowship with unfruitful works of sin. We should be reproving them by the word of God. That don't mean you're judging them, Elder Lord, but that means you're reproving the works of darkness. And my God, nobody was able to reprove you God. He didn't want to listen to his uncle. He didn't want to take his advice. Because Abraham was too spiritual. See, that's what he's trying to say. You're so spiritual. You know earthly good. I don't want to be any earthly good for the pot. I want to be some heavenly good. I want to be able to be used by God. I want to be able to be looked and praised by God. I want God to say, that's mine right there. I got my seal on her. When I tell her to speak, she speaks. When I tell her to go, she reminds me she knows. When I tell her to turn right, she turns right. When I tell her to go down, she goes down. That would belongs to me. I know of my name. Her name is written in the Lamb Book of Life. She's mine. She's one of mine. How many of you say, I want my name written? I want my name written. And not in the world, book of the world, but in the book of life. And Lord moved. He moved away from the spirit. The 
with the book of James told us don't have unfruitful works. Don't work with darkness. Some of us already moved into sin. Some of us are on our way to sin. There's continual pressure on the child of God to relax. To tone it down. It don't take all that. It don't take all that shouting. It don't take all that praise. It don't take all that worship. It don't take all that running. It don't take all that rolling on the floor. It don't take all that shouting hallelujah and glory. It don't take all that amen. amen. It don't take all that oh glory. It don't take all that. You can just sit in the church and just clap your hands and worship in silence. He wants you to tone down. The world wants you to tone down your praise. It wants you to become tolerant and flexible toward the spirit of worldliness. See, what happens when you can turn up the praise? You turn up God. And when you turn up God, when you turn up God, God going to turn up the fire. And let me tell you, so it's going to burn away all the shaft. It's going to burn away everything that's not good. It's going to keep away the fire. It's what protects you. If I got a ring of fire and camping about me, what's going to try to pass through the fire? Can't that pass through the fire to get to me because it's going to get burned? Come on, somebody. God, if you turn it up, see, Lot didn't turn it up. Lot became tolerant. Lot became flexible. Lot began to bend. But Abraham said, I'm going to stand. I've got to go the way of the Spirit. I've got to go the way the Lord is leading me. I know it looks good, nephew. But I know it ain't good. Why? Because I did hear the voice of God tell me to go that way. See, Lot should have stayed put. He should have waited on God. Wait, I say, on the Lord. He said, when you have the Lord to stand, Stand. Have your Lord brought about with truth. Having the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. Come on, somebody. God is keeping you. God kept Abraham. He kept Abraham because Abraham kept him. Do you catch that? God kept Abraham because Abraham kept him. Abraham kept his law. Abraham kept his statutes. Abraham kept his commandments. He kept his commandments and he lived. Lot woke him up and he almost died. Somebody say, Whoa! But he had a praying uncle that was famous by God. He had a praying uncle that was famous by God. And God, somebody said, Thank God for my praying mama. Thank God for my praying daddy. Thank God for my praying grandmother. Because somebody prayed me back out of the grip of death. Somebody prayed me out of the grip of sin. Somebody prayed me out of with death and destruction. Was trying to pursue me. Somebody that had favor with God had the open mind. When Abraham saw his death, the Bible says a man escaped. Soon as Lot got to the city of Sin, God gave him signs to let him know he was supposed to be here. A war broke out. The city of Sodom was overtaken. They took Lot captive. Well, Lot's being fled. And where did he go? He went to the spirit. He went to the man of God. He said they took your nephew captive. And the Bible says that Abraham rose up in haste and already had prepared his meal. Abraham didn't have to wait. Why? Because he was a praying man. And he gave weapons in the hands of all his men that had already been prepared. Why were they prepared, Sister Patricia? Because they followed a man of God that stayed close to God. And God gave them instruction. They followed his example. So when it was time to fight, they already knew the battle. They already knew they were going to win it. 
So he guided up their lives and he went after his nephew. He said, It ain't going to take him to pay because I serve the Lord. And I know he's able to deliver out of the hands of the enemy. And he guided up his Lord. He went to the camp of the enemy. You know what God is saying? We got to go to the camp of this. We got to go to the camp of Lord. We got to go to the camp of the Folks that we know that have left church, we need to go get them. We need to go get them. Abraham didn't allow Lot to stay where he was. He said, That's my nephew. That's my blood. That's my kid. And I'm going to get them. Now you're going to lose something here. You're going to lose something here. You got family members that's inside of them. God said, Turn up your loins. Get your war clothes on. Get your instruments of war in your hand. And get prepared to go to battle. Because we're going to the enemy's camp today. We're going to the enemy's camp. And we're going to take back what the devil stole. He went to the camp. Retrieve Lot. And not only did he retrieve Lot, but everybody else in the place. They were set free. Because you see, God did have to go. Because God had somebody else that was praying for their kid folks. And God used Abraham as a way of escape. He helped free him. He had to tell him to him. Lot was caught up. But Abraham was consumed by the Spirit. Lot was caught up. She was standing over around to this nation has fallen so low that there is no more compass in the world to point us to truth. You can only find that in the word of God. The line between right and wrong has been erased. From the world view, they cannot discern the difference between good and evil. But thank God for people that will call on the name of the Lord. And say, God, let me discern life from God and wrong from right. Isaiah 5 and 3 says, What was the thing that called evil good and good evil? That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We cannot bury our heads in the sand, people, and pretend that because we ignore it, it does not exist. Our nation is leading away from God. This society is leading away from God. But what concerns me the most is the church is leading towards toward tolerance of sin and compromise to avoid conflict. To avoid conflict, to gain acceptance, to fit in. Many of our pulpits have sold out. Even many of our mainline bishops a pastor, evangelist, denominational church that once held the Bible as the only standard for life acceptable to God has been skewed, has been erased, has been infected by the spirit of compromise. And no longer do they sound a clear warning against me. They have diluted, they have polluted their pulpits. For monetary gain. But we here ever find a fast Lord, we're gonna stand. We're gonna stand on truth. We're gonna stand for what's right. Because we don't need the world's money. But the Bible says the wealth of the rich is laid up for the righteous. When I read my Bible, he said, I am the Lord. I change not. He said, I own the cattle on a thousand years. He said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And they that dwell with me, God said, the king's heart layeth in my hand. And I turn it to whichsoever way I choose. So God said, if you need some finances, you ain't got to fret and fret. You ain't got to go the way of Sodom. But you can stand back footed and believe me for it. Because I'll speak to the heart and I say bless that with us right there in that green shirt with that white hair and he'll turn around and he won't know why he did it but he'll just do it and he will bless you he'll close your mind 
and a pop your socks off. Because you got people to talk. Abraham has his books. Abraham lost in the spirit. God said, You ain't got to pollute and dilute your the pool. The word of God. Because I got what you need. God's got it. To every preacher that dilutes the message and hides the truth will be held strong by God. For every soul that is lost because you refuse to preach the truth. Hear me, Facebook. Preachers. Teachers. Evangelists. That are not preaching the truth of God's word. That have not held the standard. But have polluted it for monetary and world gain. You're going to be held accountable by God. Lot and his family, they settled in Sodom. They were surrounded by sin. And what used to be repulsive now became and unthinkable now became acceptable. See what it will do with you. Go in to where God told you don't go. Now things that were not acceptable become acceptable. You can read one of the greatest passages in the Bible. Abraham, a mere man, turned the heart of God. He brought the heart of God down to earth. <laughs> he said, God, just send somebody to my nephew. God sent two angels. God sent two angels. Come on, somebody. Tell me God won't do it. I can tell you some stories right now. I know God did it. And when people tried to fight against it, prayer prevailed. I, God said, yes, you are. I'm going to tell you something. God will do it. See, when you have a prayer life, like Abraham, God has been angry to help escort them where they need to be. They don't even see it. They ain't going to be helping you cook your own, get your bags up, and come to work with you. Come. Somebody pray for you. Somebody pray for you. Look what you need. I was praying for you. I didn't know what you were going through, but you was on my mind. God brought you to my lips and my mind all the time. We thought about you. We prayed for you. I said, one thing God can do it better than we can. God knows how to deal with the hearts and the minds of people. Sometimes we just got to pray. Trust God. Lead to God. The angels took hold of their hands and pulled them out of the pulled them out of the city. I just want to take a minute and I want us to begin to thank God for pulling us out. Say thank you, Lord, for pulling me out. I was stuck in sin, but He pulled me out. He said, "It's better right now." I say, God, I thank you because You pulled me out when I needed You the most. You pulled me out. You pulled me out. God is talking to somebody. He's talking to you, Brother Todd. He said, I pulled you out. I pulled you out. I pulled you out. I pulled you out. Take your hand, Brother Todd, and pull up. Pull up the air. Pull up the God, I pulled you out of the stuff. I'm still pulling you out. Some people have been poor out of drug addiction. Some people have been poor out of alcohol business. Some people have been poor out of bad relationships. Some people have been poor out of bad business. Some people have been poor out of homosexuality. Prostitution. Depression and suicide. No self esteem. Come on, somebody. Somebody ought to get to your feet. If you ain't about shut down.
the spirit. He told Peter, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. He said, but I pray for you. See, the spirit of God, even if nobody has you on their mind and didn't utter your name from their lips, God was interceding for you. And because of his intercession, you was able to be poured out. See, when you should have been stuck, unable to find your way, he prayed and somebody, he poured you out. Touch three people and tell them he pulled me out. I was stuck pretty good, but he pulled me out. I even fought him and resisted him, but he pulled me out. He pulled me out. God still pulling us out. He still pulling us out. He still pulling us out of some stuff. He pulling us out of ourselves. He pulled us out of self. He pulled us every day out of self that we can walk closer to the spirit. in our minds during the night. He's convicting our souls during the day. You gotta become greater. You got to do more. I looked, I was looking up on Facebook yesterday. And I saw this church. And they were in another city. And I saw this young preacher. This young woman preacher. Her hands was laid. On people that didn't even know. And God was delivering. Setting free. They said God showed up and showed out. And God convicted my Lord. He said you got to do more. You got to take it to the streets. You got to take it to where people don't know. It's not in this four walls. We got to have seven services on the streets. We got to lay hands on folks on the street on Sunday morning. We need to pay the band. We need to get in our casual dress. And we need to take it to the street. Oh, yeah. We need to have service on the street. Oh, yes. Yeah. Come on. We need to say, you know what? This thing, this dress down Sunday, we go into the street. We take in the speaker system. And we're going to preach on the street corner. Come on. So we went to New Orleans. The first person we saw when we drove into New Orleans, I mean, have you ever been to New Orleans then? The time when they have having that best. And a man had a speaker, he had a pull horn, and he was sitting on the corner. Repent! I mean, streets crowded, people walking by, and he's preaching on the horn. Repent! For the kingdom of God is at hand. Did he not? He was preaching, I mean, among thousands of people. It was unashamed. And when I looked at what the Lord said, you got to do more. I didn't pull you out to stay where you were at. I pulled you out so that you could become greater and you can do more and draw more people by the preacher word. God pulled Lot out so that Lot could have a testimony. And even though the, the Bible lets us know in the New Testament that Lot, he was saved. But he had to go through the consequences of his sin. See, God will pull you out without a doubt. He'll call, let you make your choice. He'll let you do all you want to do. He'll let you rebel. He'll let you kick. He'll let you scream. He'll let you do whatever. He'll let you make the wrong choice. But you will still have to suffer the consequence of your choices. Lot was pulled out. But he still had to suffer the consequences of his choice. The chapter lets us know in the closing of the chapter. Oh my God. That Lot's two daughters. 
His wife was turned to a pillar of salt because of his choice. He lost his two son-in-laws because of his choice. His wife was turned to a pillar of salt because of the choice they made. And his daughters got him drunk and got pregnant and committed incest with their father because of the choice that they made. But in the end, let me tell you something, you can go through all that but still be saved. But all you got to do is repent. 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 Lie down somewhere to repent. He said, Lord, I know as a result of what we did, now we got the Ammonites and the Moabites, my own children by my own daughters that are enemies to the people of God. Don't you know when you go into Sodom that you come out, you will burn some stuff that ain't of God? Some stuff that's not God, and it's gonna plague you because you made the choice. But even in spite of all that, not lost everything, he lost his temple blessing, he lost his wife, his daughters, his son, and it all started with a little look at me in the wrong direction. That's it. I'm closing. I'm getting ready to close. I'm going to make this one point. And the saddest part of the whole story is through Abraham's bold intercession, the mercy of God had determined that the judgment of Sodom could be avoided if only ten righteous were found. Supposing that Lot had the power of a godly life. See, this is why it's so important to live godly. That had influenced his family toward God. They could have found four people, and the judgment of God could have been overturned. See, that's why it's important to live godly. So that your life can help turn others toward the Lord. But the sad truth is not only was there not for others to be found. Life, Lot's life, life was so unstable, so empty of condition that his sons and laws thought he was making a joke about the coming judgment. It started all with a wrong choice, a lead in the wrong direction. Let me share something with you as we close it and we're standing. God allows us to choose our own path. But he doesn't allow us to choose what destination that path will be. God will allow you to choose anything we want. Except for the consequences. We can't choose those. As a matter of fact, we have to live with the consequences of our choices. Every decision we make to at least some degree affects, affects hear me good, the direction of your future. When you don't listen, you rebel against the voice of God, your future is affected. Yeah, you're going to get to where God wants you to be. But you might carry some heavy losses in the process. All because you made the wrong choice. Every decision you make without the counsel of God, without the counsel of Godly people, is going to affect your future. For the most part, our decisions are determined by our desires. Don't you know your desires will determine your destiny? Decisions may seem small at the time. Oh, that really don't matter. I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna do what I want to do. I'm gonna go where I want to go. I'm gonna act like I want another. It may seem minute, but listen to me, good. Lot look toward the Bible said he chose. That's it. He chose. See, when you choose to do something you've been directed not to do, you made a choice. It might seem small. But 
let you never know where the roads will lead. Our children, young people, you need to think twice. When you get when people are trying to put peer pressure on you. Because you never know when you'll make the decision that will change the course of your life forever. You got in that car and you're skipping school, hanging out with the wrong people, making the wrong choices, doing the wrong things to alter the course of your life forever. Going to that dance, sneaking out of the house, doing things you're not supposed to be, rebelling against your parents. Wrong choices. Then Lot chose. And he lived forever with the consequences of that worldly mind decision. He lost everything. But he didn't lose his life. We look and we see because the power of a single decision altered the course of his future. Which way are you leaning today? What choices are you making today? Are those choices being made with God? Or they're being made by your flesh? Are those choices being directed by the Spirit? Or are they being directed by your flesh? Come on, which way are you leaning today? Facebook? Are you leaning toward God? Or are you leaning towards your own understanding? We need to lift our hands. And we need to say, God, help me lead toward the Spirit. Abraham had an altar. Lot had worldly desires. his decision making. It caused him to look toward a place that looked familiar to a place God had already delivered him from. And that was the worst decision he made in all of his life. I don't want to have to lose everything. Children, house, husband, wife. Because I chose to do it without God. What, which direction are we in? Are we still in an upright position? Or are we tilted? Because what happens when you tilt something? It becomes out of focus, don't it? So you can't see correctly. You can't make the proper decisions. You can't go the right way when you're tilted. But God is trying to draw the people of God in this house. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, oh, come on, come on. Because God is getting ready to send the masses. I've been called everything this week. One child gone. And you know what that let me know? God is getting ready to do. God's getting ready to do it. And the enemy is bad. But he can't stop it. And when God sends these souls into the house. If you're in a tilted position, you're going to get moved right out the way. Because they come with a desire to serve God. They're coming with a desire to do the work of the Lord. They're going to come with a desire and say, I'll teach you. God gave me a vision. He spoke to me. And they're going to be able to draw young people, draw children. Children are going to be saved. God said, if you don't, Keep in the right, align yourself, and stop looking to 
a tilted lens. When they come, you're going to be a queen out there. Because the, people, the ones that's coming down, they're not going to be like the traditional saints. They're not coming with a suit on and a tie, dresses down to their ankles. They're going to come just as they are. And God going to convert them. And he's going to set them on fire. And they're going to be running. They're going to be delivered out of witchcraft, Satanism, and homosexuality, and lesbianism. They're going to be delivered from drugs and alcoholism, from depression and suicidal thoughts. They're going to be coming with all kinds of things that they're going to be, God's going to be breaking chains. And because their love is going to be so great, he said, well, much has been forgiven. Much is required. They're going to be saying, God, I'm ready to give you my all. They're not going to be sitting back waiting on somebody to tell them. They're going to be in the highway and the bowing, share their testimonies. Man, hands on the sick. And they're going to be recovering. They're going to be there on the blinded eyes. They're going to be, people are going to be delivered, put down crack pipes and, and, and my God, put down needles. Put down guns and weapons. God said, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to shift the people that's willing to go for it. They're not going to have fear. They're not going to be ashamed. They're going to be fighting for it. They're going to be just as a little child. No, no fear. God said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in this house. Because I've seen your faithfulness. I've seen it. I've seen the tears you cry. I've seen the hard places. I've seen the tough spots. I've seen the valleys. And I'm going to do it. I've seen the obedience. And I'm going to do it. Stay in which you stood. He said, I'm going to do it. Your labor has not been in vain. We shall surely see it come to pass. Everybody that's standing here is going to see it come to pass. The prophecy is going to come to pass. Oh, God, this day was going to be easy. He didn't tell us that. It's gonna be a struggle. It's gonna be times you say, oh my God, is, is it gonna happen, Lord? Oh, really? It's gonna be times of doubt, times of questions. But God said, it shall surely come to pass. And the great thing about it, He's gonna be the one that do it. He said, all you got to do is give me praise. I want somebody to lift their hands and get your back. And I want you to begin to praise God. And as you praise God, God is bringing them out. God is bringing them out. God is bringing them out. God is delivering. God is set free. God is blowing. He's doing it. He's making it. He's making a way. But there was no way. He's opening doors for doors are being shut. He's opening the window. And he's pouring out blessings. He's pouring joy out this morning. If you can get your cup filled with joy, 
everything we do, we do in the name of Jesus. We pray for the sick in the name of Jesus. We raise the dead in the name of blind your eyes are open in the name of Jesus. Everything we do is done in the name of Jesus. Because that's where the power is. He said there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. If you have not been baptized in the name of Jesus, you can go down this morning in his precious name. And in the book of Romans, it tells us that when you go down in the name, you're going to come up in the newness of life. You're going to shed those old grave clothes. Now you're taking on the name of Christ. You're taking on the name of Jesus. Every knee go down, every time go under the fence. That he's God. If you need the Holy Ghost this morning, you say, God, I need the Holy Ghost. God, I've never been filled with it, but I need it because according to the book of Acts chapter 2, it says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you need the Holy Ghost this morning, you don't have the Holy Ghost. I want you to come down to the front. I want you to come down to the front if you need the Holy Ghost. If you need the Bahasha, you need the Bahasha. If you need the Holy Ghost, you can ask God for the Spirit of God. Oh, I want you to come down. Come on, anoint you in the name of Jesus. Anoint you in the name of Jesus. We're going to pray for you. That God will pour His Spirit out of you. Because we need His Spirit in this day and in this hour that we're here. We cannot make it, people, without the Spirit of God living on the inside. We the only need that's keeping us. He said, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power. God, fill us to the children. With the Holy Ghost. Fill them up, God. That they be the next generation of young people that hold up the blood stained down. God, give them the Holy Ghost at a young age. God, give them the Holy Ghost at a young age. Let them speak with other tongues and experience the fire of your spirit. Oh, God. Say, Lord, I don't want to leave. The wrong direction. I want to go in the right direction. I don't want to lead to my own understanding. But I want you to, I want to acknowledge you in all my ways. And you direct my path. Come on, people, I need direction. I need some instruction for my life. I need instruction. Oh, right now, the name of Jesus. Do it in the Lord. 
Everything that's broken, Father. God, you short, God. God, you are the potter. Oh, God, and she is the clay. Oh, God, restore and make new things. Oh, right now, the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you do it, Lord. You do it, God. Restore. Restore, Lord. Restore restoration. Woo! Restoration in the name of Jesus. In the name of oh my God, in the name of Jesus. Woo! God, won't God do it? Won't God do it? God to restore. He'll put it back in order. Oh God, God to bring restoration. He'll bring healing. Right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh my God, in the name of Jesus. God is great. Hallelujah. Oh my God. It is the Asha. Ah, God. Fire, Lord. Fire. Woo, God. Fire. Woo, fire. Fire. Spirit, Father. We thank God, hallelujah, for what we feel in this place. So, in the name of Jesus, God is opening up the floodgates. He's opening up the floodgates. If you want somebody to feel what you're feeling, go out and tell them. Go out and tell them. Say, so there's fire falling over in Refiner's Fire. Go out and tell them. Say, you want to be on the altar? You want to be consumed? Tell them. Fire is falling. God is consumed. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Oh, in the name of Jesus. He's opening up the floodgates. And it's right. He said, our ladder is going to be greater than our foot. Hallelujah. We're in the ladder. It's going to be a great outpouring, just as the day of Pentecost. Is there the sound of a rushing body wind? It's going to be a sound. Hallelujah. Because the wind and the wrecking is coming. Hallelujah. My God, my God. Father, we thank you today for, the, for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for what your word has done and 